Today's scripture reading is from John 14 and can be found on page 957 of the Bible at your seat. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, <coughs> excuse me, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is it who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest, manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, brother, for uh, reading that for us today. And thank you all for coming today. Um, uh, one of, my name is Scott Mesher, as Jason said, and we've been in Salado for 10 years. And uh, it's been a joy. It was an interesting turn in our life to get to live here uh, and to serve here and to know probably many of you through different avenues here in the community, and so it's a privilege to be here today. I do thank Jason for the opportunity to be here with you and inviting me to be a part of his sermon series. Um, I'm appreciative of a pastor who's willing to dig deep into the doctrine of God and walk you slowly through the, this, different, uh, this doctrine, although my memory of my invitation is a bit different than his. Um, and how I was tasked with this particular topic of the Trinity. Um, but that's okay. It's fair enough that I'll get to be here with him and support him in this. Because on a serious note, I do think it's a very important thing for our churches to think well about their faith. Many people who know me know that I enjoy thinking well and, and probing into the different aspects of our faith. And so I'm thankful for this opportunity to be here with, with you guys today. Um, and it's a privilege. And so I look forward to this uh, opportunity. It's been a joy for me to go back and uh, dig through uh, studies and to refresh some of these points. Uh, this past week, I know that my wife is relieved that I will finally pick up all the books that have accumulated around our living room where I read in the mornings, and so I will make sure to tidy that up this afternoon. Um, but it's going to be a good, exciting time. Uh, the Trinity is a very difficult topic to, to deal with. Um, at first, Jason said that uh, I only had 20 minutes because that's the amount of time that all of his sermons always conclude. And so I will try to stick to that as that's what you always do. Um, but when I started looking through some different things to find, try to get uh, some studies uh, and dig into this, I was reminded how difficult it is to, to really sort out this whole doctrine of the Trinity. It was a joy to sing about it, and I really appreciate the way that Sam wove together those songs, uh, taking us through the classic hymn, Holy, 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 and some more contemporary messages. It's just a reminder of the, the way that the church is continually sorting out uh, how to explain and express the beauty of the Trinity. Uh, we cannot neglect it. Uh, we continue to look for ways to, to express it, um, and it's always at the center of our worship. Uh, but when I started doing my studies, I looked back, and I found this quote from uh, a 19th century theologian, he said that the doctrine of the Trinity has always bristled with difficulties, and therefore it is no wonder that the church, in its attempt to formulate it, was repeatedly tempted to rationalize it and give it a construction which failed to do justice to scriptural data. 
Well, when I got to the end of that sentence there, and it says that the church has continually failed to do justice, I was a bit discouraged and disheartened in my efforts to present this accurately and biblically to you. So I went to another one of my favorite theologians. It was a 19th century Baptist theologian named John Dagg. He was one of the first, some would say, the first Baptist theologian of the United, in, in the United States. Um, he writes in a very simple uh, volume, uh, the Manual of Theology, and it's a very practical uh, expression of so many different theological perspectives. And I thought, surely John Dagg will have a word of encouragement for me as I seek to formulate this into a message that I could share with the church. And here's what Dagg had to say about this. He says, the most sober-minded of the divines, in other words, all the great thinkers in church history, admit that there is incomprehensible mystery in the doctrine of the Trinity. All attempts to explain it have failed. Slightly disheartened at the invitation I received from your pastor to come and share with you on the doctrine of Trinity when the first two quotes I dug up mentioned failure. But I realized that he had invited me so that he could spend the next three weeks cleaning up everything that I may mess up for you today. Um, and in my effort to minimize my mistakes and the errors I would make on trying to teach that God is three in one, I decided I would simply give you a sermon with three points condensed into one. That was a joke. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I want to do it as best I can to help us understand it because, as I said, it, was, it is a very important doctrine. It's very difficult, uh, but it's also uh, a joy to explore and to dig into it. Um, I did find a word of encouragement uh, from Millard Erickson. He's another theologian, uh, much more recent. He says, we do not hold this doctrine because it is self-evident or because it is logically cogent. In other words, it's not clearly apparent. There's no one simple passage we can go to like we do with the virgin birth uh, or, or the resurrection of Christ. Uh, but, uh, and it is difficult to explain logically. But we do hold it because God has revealed it, and this is what the Bible uh, has revealed, that this is what He is like in the Bible. As someone has once said, to try to explain it, you may lose your mind, but try to deny it and you will lose your soul. And so because we do not want to lose our souls, because we want to continue to dig into uh, the series of knowing God uh, and understanding Him and digging into His words, we will try our best today to explore this doctrine. As a, play, as a precursor, I want to set a bit of a, some groundwork. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention uh, a few titles. I'll give these to Daniel so he can share them with you uh, in your uh, study groups. But a few resources that are available, there are some great books, there are many that are written about the Trinity, some are grossly wrong and some of them are very helpful. Uh, but Bruce Ware is a great author on this subject. Uh, he has written a book called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Relationships, Roles, and Relevance. Uh, and then he was also editor of another volume uh, titled One God in Three Persons. It's a collection of essays uh, which deal with the Trinity. So Bruce Ware is a great name to follow. And there's another brother named Michael Reeves who's written a book called Delighting in the Trinity. And I'll give these to, my, uh, to Daniel so he can share them with you. Um, but I also want to kind of set down some rules of the day uh, as we go through this series. Because there's so much to deal with in, in dealing with, with this topic. The first one is simply to say that we will not look at all the scriptures that deal with this matter. Uh, your pastor did not invite me to come and give a symposium on the Trinity simply to preach a, a message to you today. And so in an effort to make sure that my bases are covered, I've prepared a scripture sheet that you can find on your way out. Uh, just common and key Trinitarian passages. Uh, some passages that walk through the plurality of who God is, that speak of God as three. Uh, the clear passages, which I'm sure you've already explored, on that God is one. I know that you've had a few sermons on that. Uh, that Jesus is God and that the Holy Spirit is God. All of these matters laid out in a few simple verses. But even this sheet that I prepared to give to you to supplement the scriptures that we'll look at today has a disclaimer which says this is not a complete uh, and exhaustive list. So uh, I just want to make sure that it's clear that we will not deal with uh, all of the scriptures. In fact, I anticipate after this that some may come to me or to your pastor or in your small group say, I wonder why we didn't deal with this passage on the Trinity. Time is simply our restriction, uh, our, our limiter on, on this matter. There's much to be said. A second rule of the day for our discussion and our time together here is that we must be willing to think well. We must be willing to admit that this, uh, uh, or be willing to think well about this doctrine. Uh, because it is difficult to understand it, uh, because it's difficult to understand, does not mean that we should neglect it or push it aside. There are many truths about God that are very difficult for our finite and limited minds to grasp, but we must recognize that they are true because they're revealed to us from Scripture. 
The concept of omnipresence, that God is present everywhere at all times, is a difficult thing. It's a word that's not in the Bible, but it's something that we believe true about God. We believe it true, especially as churches who participate in missions, because right now in this, pl- in this place, we worship God, while on the other side of the world, there are people groups who are celebrating and worshiping the same God. He is present. So the word is difficult, the concept is difficult, but we continue to pursue it. In a similar way, we must be willing to explore this doctrine of the Trinity and understand the compl- some of these complexities as best we can. There's nothing that rich, enriches our faith than when we allow our faith to seek understanding. When we are guided by the things that are difficult to understand, uh, seeking truth, uh, seeking to understand it through the guidance of God's Word to develop a, a grander and greater picture of who God is. Um, our tendency is to dismiss these things that are difficult, Um, Sometimes we uh, want to set them aside like an ingredient. We may not know why it's particularly involved in a recipe. We want to leave it out because we don't understand why it's there. When it comes to this doctrine, we cannot leave it out. We must continue to pursue uh, and seek to understand it as best we can uh, in our our search. It's also similar to the, the concept of a vehicle. We readily get into our vehicles, we stick our key into the ignition, and we turn it, and we hope that it will start. But most of us in this room cannot explain all the complexities of what's happening inside of our hood. At the first time it doesn't start, we know to go to check the gas, maybe the air pressure in the tires, maybe the windshield wipers, but all of those wires and complexities in there we don't understand. Yet, we quickly get into our cars and and we'll drive off. In a similar way, we must be willing to explore and and dig deep into this idea, into this doctrine, and, and seek to understand it. We must understand that man did not invent the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not something that was created or just uh, invented like, hey, this would be a great idea. It wasn't a group of church fathers just sitting around a, a, a church meeting with, with, with their fried chicken and, and their macaroni casseroles and just said, this would be a really great thing to establish as a, as a part of what, a, of what we should believe. It wasn't a for, part of a committee meeting necessarily. It's something that has been formulated over the years to protect the church against errors to protect us from bad ideas that uh, the world and other thinkers were creating. Men have risked their lives to preserve the truth of this doctrine, that Jesus is God, that God is God, that the Spirit is God, but yet there is only one God. And so they've worked diligently through time to to express it and formulate it, pulling from the Scriptures alone to, to, to find this truth to help us to understand it. And so in some way today, I hope that we can explore this truth in that same sort of way. The third rule of the day is that we will understand this unique, uh, the unique nature of this doctrine. As I said a few minutes ago, the doctrine of the virgin birth is clearly stated in, in Scripture. We know that we can go straight to Luke chapter 2 or to, to the first chapters of Matthew and, and draw on this idea and find this, this message taught there. We can go back to the Old Testament and see that it points us to the, the, to the virgin birth and the, the teachings of Isaiah. And so there's a clear line of, of, that, of, that, of that doctrine of the virgin birth, something that's very difficult to, to, to understand, something that's foreign in our culture today. No father in, the, in, our, in our community would, would believe that his daughter was telling him uh, that she was divinely, uh, or that a child was divinely conceived in her. We would immediately go searching for the young man who was responsible for this act. But yet this doctrine exists, we have it in Scripture, and and we can easily believe it because of its clear representation in Scripture. When we come to the doctrine of the Trinity, it is present in the Old Testament, and it is present in the New Testament, but its formulation is not nearly as clear of a line as some of these other things that we see. So we must understand quick, in a simple way, how how this has come about uh, in in, in how we find it in Scripture. If you want one book that helps you to to draw out this doctrine the most, it's perhaps the Gospel of John, which is why we chose it for our scripture reading today. In the Gospel of John, it's the most theological of all four of the Gospels. John is continually wrestling with this idea of, uh, of who Jesus is, why he's doing what he's doing, and he's doing it to show us that he is God. And in the Gospel of John, he promises to send the Holy Spirit who will proceed from God the Father. Uh, And so you have all of this entangling. But Jesus himself is saying, I am the Father. And so the Gospel of John is maybe the one book in the New Testament where we could pull all of this together and and draw out this truth. Simply stated, Paul refers to the Trinity in his conclusion of 2 Corinthians when he he concludes that that letter uh, with a blessing mentioning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But how do we understand this doctrine? You see, John formulated it in his Gospel. 
And one of John's disciples was named Polycarp. He was an early church leader who already recognized the challenge of formulating this doctrine. Polycarp, coming uh, just out of that first century church, uh, and he was, was a martyr for the church, for his faith. He was a great defender of the faith. He sought to, to, to continually reformulate the teachings of the Gospels uh, and defend them against errors which were attacking the church. And as he went to his death, his final words were, Therefore I praise you, speaking to God for all things. I bless you, I glorify you, along with the everlasting and heavenly Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, with whom to you, O Holy Ghost, be glory, from, uh, be, be glory both now and to all coming ages. Amen. In the end of his life, he's praying to God, uh, for uh, thanking him for his life, uh, calling out in the name of Jesus Christ, and recognizing the presence of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit in this end of his prayer. His disciple Irenaeus comes along just after that, about a hundred years after the Gospel of John was written. Uh, and Irenaeus, now a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, who sought to formulate this trinity, uh, this doctrine as well as he could, is faced with even greater challenges from outside, pushing against the church about how Jesus could be both God and both and, and man at the same time, and how the Holy Spirit fits into this into into this scenario. And so Irenaeus writes a complete work titled Against Heresies. He recognizes that these are full-on attacks against what he considers to be the truth of God's Word as revealed in Scriptures. And when he writes, he writes that the church, though dispersed through our whole world, the gospel has been advancing. He says, even to the ends of the earth has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith, that we believe in one God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth the sea, and the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations of God. The statement becomes formulated in what many uh, of you may have cited and very similar to what you might have, have recited known as the Apostles' Creed. It was a very simple statement that recognized God the Father Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's putting this together to preserve this truth of this doctrine, which is difficult to pull out of the Scriptures. If we fast forward about another 200 years into, in, through history, we come to a time period when Constantine was the king uh, uh, and, and uh, had come to his, uh, some understanding of, of the, the truth of Christianity. And a young guy named Athanasius comes along and, on the scene. He recognizes that people all over the place are denying that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. He recognizes that there's a great deal of confusion about what the Holy Spirit is, and not even asking the question who he is. Athanasius approaches the king, Constantine, and he says, we've got to sort this out. There's people all over the place that are really confused about these things. Constantine, desiring to be a great emperor, says, you know what, let's do, let's have a council. Let's get a bunch of people together and let's sort this out. Athanasius, whose nickname was the Black Dwarf, that's a whole other set of information that's really fun to explore, but he says, this is great. Let's get everybody together. We'll get them all in one room. We'll have a good time, and we'll sort this out. And so they do, and they establish what was then known as a document, a statement, which was called the Nicene Creed. In this Nicene Creed, they sought to explain that there are simply three persons, uh, and that the, uh, um, three persons, but yet only one God. And using the phrase that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. This still left some clar lack of clarity. Another guy named Arius comes along and he takes these ideas and he runs a completely different direction and begins to deny some truths about Jesus Christ that were essential. Not until several hundred years, uh, another, uh, not hundred years, but several years later, uh, they established a, 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 a statement defining this, this idea of the Trinity, known as the Athanasian Creed. It was finally settled upon uh, in the Council of Chalcedon in 451. So they went from a document that was a simple statement known as the Apostles' Creed, which was a few simple lines, to the Nicene Creed, which fit on one note card that was pretty simple to memorize and state, to the Athanasian Creed, which takes up three, two and a half columns of information, sorting out, explaining, and describing who God is and how He exists is three in one. That the Father is created, the Son is created, uncre uh, the Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. That the Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The document goes on and on in detail, describing so many different aspects of who God is, related in relation to being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And why did they do this? Because they recognize that it was a truth that's revealed in Scripture that is essential to our faith. That to try to understand it may drive you crazy, but to deny it would mean to lose your soul. And these men chose to expand and deepen the understanding and strengthen their mind about this doctrine rather than run the risk of losing their soul and letting the church run astray from the truth of how God has revealed Himself to us. Oh, it is a great doctrine. It is a valuable doctrine in the history of the church. It's one uh, some of these men lost their lives over, over, over refining and, and defending its truth. And so it's one that we should look at today as we allow ourselves to continue to grow in our understanding and seek to understand exactly who God is through this doctrine. I want to invite you to pray with me as we seek to ask God uh, to guide us in this discussion uh, in this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God that you have shown yourself to us in this way. God, I am thankful for the songs we've already sung, which guided us through expressing these truths well. I'm thankful, Father, that as we sang them, we were able to begin to think about the, the depths of this truth. I'm thankful, Father, that we have an opportunity to discuss this today, and I pray that you would help us to think well, that we would be guided by your word, uh, that your scriptures would draw us to understand you in a deeper and, and, and richer way. So that when we go out from this place, we can live with more boldness, with more certainty, with more clarity about who you are, and that we would live in ways that glorify you. May your Holy Spirit be present today. We know he is, but may we be aware of his presence today uh, to open our minds and our hearts to understand the revelation that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I thank for, to my brother who read that scripture for us. Um, that is very helpful, and I want to walk us through it just a bit uh, as, a, as a passage. Do not worry with the lengthy introduction, which included so much history. We're not going to go through that entire passage verse by verse, um, and so uh, it's okay. Your crockpot should be okay for a few more minutes. I want to make sure you understand that. The um, first thing I want us to see, though, is that when John begins his gospel, he begins by explaining that there uh, are, uh, it is assumed in John's gospel that there is but one God. I know that uh, Jason has been preaching on this for the last few weeks, uh, several weeks, so I don't want to spend a long time establishing this truth. I'm going to trust that you have been taught that well. If you have not, you can go to this church's website. All of the sermons are there. You can brush up on that doctrine. A few simple passages that remind us of that is the clear statement in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's no clearer statement in Scripture than that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I would also point out how John's introduction of his gospel echoes the introduction of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God. John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, beginning with, uh, In the beginning was the Word. A very similar parallel. We know that John is a full believer in the fact that there is one God. He is not trying to confuse us in his gospel. He's trying to help us to understand the fullness of who this God is. And repeatedly through his gospel, he uses that phrase, and Jesus did these things so that you will know. John's desire is to bring clarity to the revelation of God uh, in, in, through his past, in, in, through, in, in his teaching. And so uh, I brought a few things to help us understand this. This is a classic Christian symbol for, that is, uh, was used a long time ago. The yod in the, the center of the blue represents a, the Hebrew letter of the yod, which is the first letter of Yahweh, the Hebrew word for God. So this was a symbol that was used in, in uh, ancient Christianity to represent God. Uh, it represents uh, the, the name of Yahweh, which was the sacred name of God, and uh, includes the idea of God being one. In the Old Testament, when we see the name Elohim, we won't spend a long time on this, uh, but it is one of the ways that we recognize that God is mentioned in a plural way. Uh, so in much of the references to God in Genesis, he refers to man was created in our image. Uh, he uses the first person plural several times. Um, but he is one God who represents himself to us. As we come to this passage, then that truth is established that there is one God. And so Jesus begins speaking in this passage uh, and, and, and talking to his disciples, and, and it begins to introduce us to these, this, the complexity of these ideas. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So right off the bat, we have Jesus speaking. I have another classic symbol for Jesus Christ. It's most probably called the key row, although our 
uh, the, uh, our Greek um, organizations on college campuses would call this a Cairo. Um, it's a key row. The some letter in the center is an, looks like an X, is a Greek letter key. And the long R, uh, or it looks like a giant P, is actually the rho symbol, which is the R sound in Greek. And so it's the first two letters of Christ in the word Greek. And so through church history, this symbol was used to represent Christ. If you go to a church that has stained glass windows, many times you'll see some of these symbols. And now you know what they mean. You could be a really educated Christian. You can do like I do when I get distracted visiting churches and look at their art and decide, hmm, what do they believe? And you can go around their, their stained glass windows. When you see this one, there's some uh, example of a belief uh, in who Christ is. And so this is Christ speaking in this passage. He says, I will ask the Father, and the Father will, will give you another, the Helper, uh, to be with you. Um, you know, when Jesus is speaking, he is talking about the Father. So it's an indication that there is some other person who is involved in this conversation. Uh, Jesus is speaking. He's going to ask the Father. And now we introduce the third party of this, uh, this relationship, the Helper, the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, in verse 26, he, he nearly repeats his, the, the same statement, verse 25 and 26. He says, These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, uh, whom the Father will send in my name, the Father's going to do this, He will teach you all these things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So Jesus, in speaking in this passage, uh, brings us already to the tension that we must resolve. You have Jesus, uh, you have the fa- who's talking to the Father, to send to you the Spirit. So there are either three persons in this passage, or Jesus is a bit nuts in what he's trying to say. He could be a lunatic. He could be a person who's completely off his rocker. And when he is saying these things, he's really talking about himself, uh, that he is going to tell himself to send him himself back to you later. It's one option. It's not a viable option. It's not really received through history. Instead, we must wrestle through the relationship that he, that he demonstrates in this passage. Jesus is not the same person as the Father because he is speaking to the Father. Jesus is not the same person as the Holy Spirit. He is calling that the Father will send the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the same person as the Holy Spirit because the Father, as it says in verse 6, will send the Holy Spirit in his name. And so clearly we have established here in this passage the difference of these three people. Uh, And Jesus, uh, at the hub of this conversation, helps us to see it. Clearly we have the three distinct persons. Another passage which is similar, which helps us to quickly see the the presence of the Trinity, is in Matthew chapter 3, at the baptism of Jesus Christ. You have Jesus himself being baptized, you have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and you have the voice of the Father saying, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So there are passages which help us to see uh, the, the, the truth uh, of these three persons uh, functioning together and all representing a divine presence. But they are also seen as one. Jesus identifies himself with the Father in this passage as well. Go back to verse 15 where he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The commandments that he's referring to are not just a reference to the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, His reference to keep my commandments is a reference to all that he has been teaching, equating his teaching with the teaching of God with God's word. And which is why John was very comfortable introducing the very beginning of his gospel saying, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And he goes on down in verse 14 to say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The shortest Christmas story in the whole Bible, John 1, 14, the word being Jesus Christ coming. So Jesus is calling on his disciples to keep his commandments, to keep his word. He's identifying himself with God. If this is not explicit enough, you can go back to John chapter 10, verse 30, where Jesus explicitly says in one of the few moments, he, he, he's so clear to state, I and the Father are one. How confusing is this? He's calling out that he's going to uh, ask the Father to send the Spirit, but yet he's saying that I and the Father am one. God's word is my word. I am the word. And and Jesus is representing the the presence of God in all that he has done. He is a clearly distinct person, but fully divine and one in essence with God. It's an incredible picture. Some of you are falling asleep. Some of you wish I'd just be quiet so we can go home right now and say, I just want to love Jesus and be a good Christian. Some of you, thankfully, and hopefully you've been intrigued by the complexity and and the beauty of of the statement of of this that's, that's being built here. But Jesus is identifying himself with the Father while also establishing himself as a distinct person. 
So two words that will help us to bring some clarity. They are distinct persons, but they are one in essence. The distinct person of Jesus from the Father, but yet one in essence in the truth of the word that they express. They're one in who in their purpose of redeeming mankind uh, to satisfy the wrath of God the Father. So we have Jesus clearly established as a person. But uh, what about this Holy Spirit? Another classic symbol which I mentioned is a representation of the Holy Spirit descending uh, as a dove. Uh, this, he is mentioned in this passage. For those of you who are in algebra right now, you can look at this passage with me from, uh, and we'll exercise a bit of that algebra that you would, would see. In the first verse 16, Jesus is talking. He says, I will send, he will give you another, the helper, who will be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The helper being A is equal to B, the spirit of truth. The helper is the spirit of truth. Go down to verse 26, and he says, the helper, there's A, is the Holy Spirit, being C. So if A equals B and A equals C, then B equals C. So all you algebra students are just really loving that moment. Um, but Jesus is, is talking about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is a helper. He's a comforter. He's the spirit of truth. And in fact, in verse 26, he identifies all of that in the person, the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, who is the third part of this trinity. This third person is a distinct person. Again, Jesus is not referring to some other form in which he's going to come back. He's talking about a person who will come. And when we sang this song just a few minutes ago, uh, Sam uh, was inviting us and, and teaching us a new song about the Holy Spirit. As I thought through the song, I thought through the different ways that people might understand that song. When we understand that, it is a, that the Holy Spirit is a person and we are inviting Him into this place, we are inviting the presence of God as a person to come in in a personal way that we can interact with the person of God in the Holy Spirit in this place. Many times we get off track in our understanding of the Holy Spirit and we think of Him as some sort of power or, or mysterious essence or mysterious uh, sort of uh, like a, a mojo type thing that we can really work it up in here by, by playing the right songs and getting the lights right and, and we can sort of evoke some sort of spirit. He's not a mis mystical presence that comes about because of something we've conjured up. It is as simple as the song is saying, that we sang. He is a person, the third person of the Trinity, one person of God who we can invite to personally come into a place to interact with us, to help us to understand God's truth, to help us understand, uh, to, to intercede for us when we pray, to help guide us in the way that God is speaking to us through his word. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a person in a very clear and, 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 uh, and an exact way in this passage. And we must recognize that he is that very thing. He goes on in chapter 16 of the same gospel to describe the, 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 the Holy Spirit again using personal pronouns to refer to him as he and him repeatedly. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul draws on this same truth, recognizing the role of the Holy Spirit in drawing us to salvation. He's not a power or a presence or a mystical thing. He is one part of the Trinity. He is the third person of, that, of the Trinity. He is a person who works in our lives and guides us and leads us. So we come to these three difficult truths. We have a God who's in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have each of these persons being fully divine, lacking nothing in their divinity, and each participating and interacting with us in our life. But yet there's only one God, the God who exists as three persons in one essence. I don't know if I've brought us to any clarity, perhaps just greater depths, but I warned you at the beginning, so many efforts have failed. So perhaps at this point, we should turn to some analogies to help us to get a better picture. Some of you have enjoyed the history. Some of you have enjoyed the theology. For those of you who've waited for the practical, we're there now. The problems with analogies, though, is they often lead us into other heresies. I think the first one that's listed is tritheism. Simply what it means what it says, three gods. Some people just simply want to say, you know what, Scott, this is so complicated, man. You're, my head is swimming right now. Uh, I just really want to go home and watch football and eat chili. And so just stop. I'm just going to go with this idea. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit's God. The Father's God. Boom, we're done. If we stop there and do not recognize the unity, we end up with a very big problem called tritheism. 
we look like a lot of other religions in our world which celebrate polytheism or multiple gods. They are not three distinct gods, and we must be careful that we do not allow ourselves and our lazy theology to just drift into the idea that they're just three simply distinct gods because clearly the Bible has established there is only one God. Another error that we may drift into is this idea of called partialism. It's a big word, but it's simple to understand. The idea of this would be uh, common, uh, especially in some of our superhero movies of today, where this superhero has a certain element of power, this superhero has a certain element or a certain uh, uh, hero ability, and another superhero has another certain ability, or maybe this guy has one gem, and this guy has another gem, and this guy has another gem, and we finally get all of these gemstones in one spot, we have the full power. When all the superheroes are united in one area, we have the fullness of power to demonstrate. This is the idea of partialism, that God is part, or the Father is part of this, the Spirit is part of this, and Jesus is part of this. When all three of them are really together, we really get the whole enchilada of who God is. It's not an exact, exactly accurate picture. A lot of illustrations fail at this point. The idea of the apple pie, some people have used that, the crust, the goo, and the, uh, the apples inside, that they're each individual. The problem is they leave each of those three things distinct uh, and do not recognize the common essence of who they are. Each holds a part of the power of God, but each one in its own self is not fully divine, as the Scripture tells us of the persons of the Trinity. Another problem, uh, another uh, analogy that we may drift into is one that's called modalism. This is the most common mistake that we make. It's so simple and easy to make. We think of it quickly when we think of water. Scott, come on, everybody knows the Trinity's like water. Why are you taking so long to explain this? Because water exists as water, you can freeze it, and now it's ice, you can boil it, and now you've got steam. Clearly, that's three in one, right? They're all H2O, it's all in, the, in, each of those places, in, in each of those things. The problem with an analogy like this is that water, H2O, is existing in different modes and not all at the same time. God does not drift from being the Father to the Son to the Spirit, back to the Son. Oh, it's Christmas, back to the Son. Now we're back to the, it's Sunday morning, now I'm the Spirit. Now it's Monday and I'm going to raise the Son, now I'm back to the Father. He does not drift in and out of modes of existence. He is always the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. <clears throat> These types of analogies can draw us, they can help us maybe to get a better understanding, but they'll never fully help us <clears throat> understand who God is. In a similar way, we like to use the illustration of an individual being a father, a husband, uh, a minister. Again, three different roles, but not all the same in the same way at the same time. So we go to another one. There's another one that was, uh, I think I mentioned Arianism. Won't spend a long time on that. But basically it says that the Spirit and the Son proceed from God. That God somehow do just drops them down. Again, a problem for us in, in our church. I found a quick image that I think will be helpful. For some of you, this will suffice to understand the, uh, the Trinity. This next image is a uh, backup one. Or... There it is. We on one end have God the Father, one God. On the other end of the pole, we have three son, uh, the three persons. Somewhere in the middle, on this closed line of tension, hangs the doctrine of the Trinity. Some of you are going to write this down. This will be your image. This will be what sticks in your mind, and you'll be happy. This image really does not allow us to drift too far into many uh, bad, bad ideas. It suffices at, the great, at, at, at its most simple uh, understanding. And so some of you may want to grab that and just hold on to that. Another image that comes along is another, it helps us get a little bit more accurate. And this image captures everything that we've tried to communicate from this passage of Scripture and from the Scriptures as a whole throughout today. Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Spirit. But Jesus is completely and always fully God. God the Father is completely and always fully God. The Holy Spirit is completely and always God. But the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. In this picture, you can see sort of the tension uh, of what it is. One final uh, image that might help you. Uh, it comes from a, a Celtic knot, which is also called a triketra, uh, where they, it is intended to be one continuous string that overlaps in a knot, forming three different points. So you have one continuous string pointing out in three different directions. One string in a knot form, pointing in three different directions to help us sort of conceptualize possibly what, this is, what the idea of the Trinity is supposed to be. He is the Father. He is the Son. He is the Spirit. We cannot deny these truths. We must allow these truths to, to enrich and guide us in our lives. 
And again, to move us further down the road of practical understanding why this matters to us today. This one passage allows us a glimpse into the doctrine of the Trinity, but how does it really affect our life uh, and our daily lives? It's a doctrine that's held by the church. It's woven through the New Testament. It's revealed in the Old Testament. But what does it really matter to me today? I want to walk through a series of very quick points, and I'll give this list to Daniel for you to use in your study groups uh, in, in, later in the week. The first, the doctrine of the Trinity as it relates to Scriptures. The Holy Spirit inspired men to record the revelation of God the Father and His plan to redeem us through His Son, Jesus Christ. As the, the formation of Scripture, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is essential to our understanding, proper understanding of, the, of, of Scripture. The Holy Spirit guided men uh, to, to, to re- and the revelation of God the Father, pointing us to our redemption in Jesus Christ. The, the Trinity and creation. Uh, yeah, the Trinity and creation. Again, the Holy Spirit hovered above the waters, as mentioned in Job chapter 33. Uh, God speaking it into creation, as mentioned in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, and all that was created by Him, Jesus Christ, and for Him, Jesus Christ, as mentioned in Colossians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1. The doctrine of the Trinity is essential in our understanding of the creation. It helps us to understand the, 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 the depth which God worked in that. The doctrine of Trinity and providence, uh, that God is over all things, that He is a sovereign God. We see God's plans and purposes uh, are ultimately fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit draws and guides His people according to His purposes. In God's plan of providence, it is essential that we understand the work of each of these three. The Trinity in our salvation, uh, from uh, uh, another 19th century theologian, the whole work of redemption is ascribed to the triune God, but each of the persons is, re- is revealed as sustaining distinct official relation to it. The Holy Spirit calls us out of the darkness to put our faith in Jesus Christ, to satisfy the wrath of God the Father against our sin. Christ died to satisfy the wrath of God against sin, and the Holy Spirit is the one who moves us to see our need uh, of Jesus in our lives. The doctrine of the Trinity in our baptism. We we believe, uh, according to Matthew 28, uh, according to the, the experience of Jesus Christ, that we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know, for some of you who may come from especially difficult backgrounds, your pastor may choose to baptize you in all three, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that is not necessarily necessary uh, from Scripture. The doctrine of Trinity in prayer, probably one of the most interesting parts of, of, this, uh, of, of, of the practical parts of this. Our relationship with God the Father, by the work of Jesus Christ, we pray and we have the promises from Scripture in Romans chapter 8 uh, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our prayer. Uh, that when we call out to God, the Holy Spirit is interceding with His groans in a sort of, as, a, as a sort of intermediary translator of what's really in our heart to God the Father. This is a very encouraging and very scary truth at the same time that the Holy Spirit is interpreting our heart when we are praying. That means that if our heart is lazy and he's interpreting that, he is capturing our laziness to God. When our hearts are heavy and burdened, he is capturing that and conveying that to God. The Holy Spirit is at work in our life of prayer. And people often ask, in whose name should I pray? Should I pray to Jesus? Should I pray to God? Should I pray to the Holy Spirit? Can I pray to the Holy Spirit? You don't have to pray to the Holy Spirit because when you pray to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is at work in your prayer. You are free because of your relationship with Jesus Christ to pray directly to God the Father. It's the beautiful uh, truth of of, of the work of Jesus Christ. I must keep moving. The Trinity and missions that we are called by God, guided by the Spirit to declare the truth of Jesus Christ. The Trinity in our daily life. Again, the Scriptures are loaded with promises of the Spirit being our comforter, as we've read here, of the Spirit in Romans chapter 8, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, being with us in a daily life, the promise of our salvation uh, uh, in our daily life, the hope that we have in our salvation in Jesus Christ, the God uh, of glory uh, uh, over us, the access we have to God in our daily life through prayer and through His Word. So what does this mean for me? To wrap all of this up, because many of you are now very hungry for lunch. We must seek to understand God more each day. In a simple way, we must not be afraid to let our understanding of who God is grow. Many times we face difficulties in life, and it is because our understanding of God is too small. 
Many times we are overwhelmed with the things of life because our understanding of who God is is too uh, puny. It is too weak in our understanding. We must be willing to seek to understand God more and more each day. Ezekiel Hopkins said, Why do we go about so destitute and sad when we have a God who is so great and so capable to do so much more? We must be willing to let our minds be stretched by the greatness of who God is and not intimidated by these truths. When we can start a study with the promise that we will likely fail, we should have freedom to explore and learn as much as we can while we are in the Scriptures and while we are under good teaching to understand the greatness of God. The more grand our understanding of God, the more we will appreciate the work of our salvation. The more grand our understanding of God, the more we will be amazed by His grace and seek to live by faith. The more grand our understanding of God, the more significant the time we spend in worship will be. Let us seek to understand God more each day. Secondly, we must be willing to live with courage. When we understand these truths, we are reminded that our salvation is secure in Christ and that the Holy Spirit will be with us. When we understand that God didn't just grant us salvation and then say, good luck, young man, go figure it out on your own. When we understand the complexity of the Trinity, we understand that we're saved by Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes with us and we have His Word to guide us. It should give us courage in our faith walk. It should give us courage in our faith journey. It should give us courage in the face of this world that is filled with chaos and confusion. Because God is with us. He did not leave us alone. When we understand the complexities and the depths of who God is, it should give us courage to live in this crazy world in which we live. Hopefully it will challenge us to be more bold in our faith to share the message of Jesus Christ at the prompting of the Holy Spirit and pointing people to God the Father. Finally, it should remind us to live with purpose, recognizing that God has a plan. If He can put together something so complex as this truth and reveal it to us through these 66 books over all of these centuries in a way that, the, that, that we can stand in a room like this and sing about it and find some comfort in it, if a God can put together such a complex message in a way that we can celebrate... Surely, He can organize and help you in your life. The God of this great complexity is the God who desires to have a personal and intimate relationship with you. And He has a purpose for your life. The difficulty you're going through is preparing you for the next section of, of your life. The sickness that you've been through, God is using to prepare you to minister to someone who will also go through that. The financial challenge you've been through, God is using to take you and prepare you for some other purpose. The gifts that you have inside of you, the, the things that you are naturally talented at, God gave them to you on purpose so that you would use them for His glory. Some of you are very artistic and, 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 and seek to express yourselves in that way. God did that on purpose as a part of His plan so that you would use it to glorify Him. Some of you are very organized and diligent and mathematic in, mind, in your mindset. God put that in you and recognize that it is a part of His plan. God wants you to live with a purpose. It reminds me that God has a plan. And just as Jesus promises in this passage, I will ask the Father. He will give you another, the Helper, to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world cannot receive it because He doesn't know Him. But you, you know Him. And He dwells with you and He will be in you. An intimate relationship that God wants with us. Not that He's a power or a mystical thing you have to go find. The promise is that He will be with you. He will dwell in you. Again, He repeats the promise. Remember all that I have said to you. I would teach these things to you. That, I will do, that God will do these things in, in, his, in my name. That He will teach these things to you. And I will be with you. It's a promise. So that we can understand Him greater and more each day. So that we can live with courage. So that we can find purpose in our lives. It's no wonder that Paul and all of the effort he made to communicate to the church at Corinth through two letters. Can you imagine being the church that had to get written to twice? Two of the longest letters in the New Testament. But he ends it by saying this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for this day. We have sought to understand you in a deeper way. Seeking to do this while knowing that we will never fully understand who you are or all of your ways while we are still limited here on this earth. So, Father, we pray that you would let this be the beginning of our understanding, the beginning of our journey of walking and growing and knowing you and in, in your word in a deeper way. God, if there's someone here today who has never wrestled with these truths, may they come to grips with the fact 
But the only way they can know you is through your son, Jesus Christ. And the person who is pulling on them right now is the presence of your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to recognize the work that you do around us, the ways you protect us as we go into this week, the ways you provide for us, the ways your Spirit works in other people to communicate words to us. God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. Use us for your glory as we go out today. In Jesus' name, amen.